questions, but I'd like to bring up the next panel who, who are going to talk about um, some of the issues around the budget and sort of respond to it, but also talk a little bit about, I think, a great new initiative that um, some of the groups in this room have come together on, which is to sort of develop a coalition around, around the children's budget for the first time. So why don't you guys come on up? So thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you again for being here. It's uh, a little bit of a different role for me. Uh, I only started with Senator Casey about three or four weeks ago. Um, so it's a pleasure to be back, I guess, as an alumni, uh, alumnus of First Focus. Um, but I will say, even being up on the Hill now, it's great to still get all the information. And you guys do a fantastic job. Obviously, I'm slightly biased. But um, one, of the, one of the pieces that I was most excited about with, uh, with the Budget Summit, besides the book and being finished with it, was um, to be able to speak on this really great initiative that we started about eight months ago. Um, we created a Children's Budget Coalition. And all around sort of that whole piece that Bruce discussed earlier of wanting to create will and, you know, creating sort of a unified force. Um, we all know that when we're, you know, for the most part, when we work in coalitions, we're all on the same message. Um, you know, we really tend to get a lot more things done than when we sort of splinter off and, and fight amongst, uh, or in the community fight, fight amongst itself. Um, so our, our goal, especially on the budget piece, was that, you know, the, the budget is sort of this big, broad thing that is so hard to advocate for, you know, because by the time you get to that appropriation season, oftentimes you've sort of lost the, lost the battle already. The, the budget decisions are made, you know, much earlier, um, you know, when the overall pot is sort of set or, you know, even in, a, in an agreement that could be years prior to when that actual current year's appropriations are set. So our idea was, you know, how do we sort of raise awareness among the community? How do we raise awareness among advocates um, to really start, you know, sounding the cry early as early as possible to make sure that, you know, now in my role on Capitol Hill, people don't, um, you know, don't forget. Um, and I see some folks from Senator Murray's office and, you know, I would be remiss in, in thanking them uh, for the work that, that Senator Murray has done um, and really the whole committee staff has done in, in raising these issues up um, and, and continuing to push them among, uh, among the Senate. So I wanted to introduce some members of our, our panel who have joined us today. And we've got a distinguished, absolutely distinguished group of advocates here from some of the best advocacy groups um, around. So uh, to my left here is Dennis Johnson, uh, who's the Executive Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at the Children's Health Fund, uh, which is a nonprofit organization committed to providing health care to the nation's most medically underserved children. Uh, and Dennis is joining us from New York, so we thank him especially for coming down. Uh, he's the director also of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, uh, their public policy and government affairs and advocacy agenda uh, at, the, uh, at Columbia University. And then to his left, we've got Steve Taylor, who is the Senior Vice President and Counsel for Public Policy at United Way Worldwide. Uh, United Way is a leadership and support organization for the network of nearly 1,800 community-based uh, United Ways in 45 countries and territories around the world. It advances the common good, or excuse me, 45 states and territories. Uh, it advances the common good, creating opportunities for a better life for all by focusing on education, income, and health. Uh, and Mr. Taylor, Steve has spent um, over 10 years working uh, up on Capitol Hill, most recently with Senator Chuck Hagel, and he hails from New Mexico, which is near and dear to Bruce's heart, uh, as well in the Southwest, and spent time working in the state legislature there. And then to his left, we've got Mark Egan uh, from the National Education Association, and Mark is their Associate Director of Government Relations. Um, NEA is the largest professional employee organization committed to advancing the cause of public education. Um, in 2010, Mark was uh, most notably recognized for his work on the uh, on the Stimulus Act and getting a huge amount of money, uh, helping to get a huge amount of money to save teachers' jobs around the country. And uh, for that, he was named one of the uh, Washingtonians 40 under 40, their best young lobbyists. I will not I will not share how old he is now. Um, Couldn't qualify anymore. 
<laughs> and then to his left, last but not least, is uh, Alyssa Cordenschmier, who I guess actually probably gets the award for traveling the furthest from, uh, from Michigan. Uh, and Alyssa is the National Budget Campaign Director at Moms Rising. And uh, Moms Rising was our co-convener, is the co-convener with First Focus on the Children's Budget Coalition. So special thanks to Alyssa for all her work on that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Moms Rising is an on-the-ground and online grassroots organization of more than a million people who are working to achieve economic security for all moms, women, and families. And prior to coming to Moms Rising, she was a poverty and policy expert at the Jewish Council for Public Affairs uh, and the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now. Um, so with that, wanted to just first off ask the panel, so you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the bigger picture pieces of the budget and you know, Bruce showed all the great charts and, and where sort of the, the trend lines have been, but what I'd like each of you to, to spend a couple of minutes to talk about what the real life impact has been in the sectors that you guys represent and in the communities that you work with. So uh, Dennis, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Jared. And uh, it's a pleasure being here today. And, and uh, I'm grateful for um, the opportunity to talk to everyone here, as I have for, for 22 years of my career doing uh, children's health advocacy at the Children's Health Fund. And, and I just want to uh, applaud um, the effort the first focus has put in today issuing this report. It's a tremendous, tremendous document and will be extremely helpful for all of us uh, out there in the field, uh, even in places like New York where it's just hard to get data rich and you know uh, uh, pieces of work like this to, to drive our advocacy efforts at the state level, especially if we're trying to work on, on uh, the, the same congressional candidates you folks inside the Beltway are, are trying to handle. We, we try and hit them in the states and, and so it's very useful for that purpose and so I applaud that work. Um, at the Health Fund, where I've been for, for uh, 22 years, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we support a network of uh, programs, innovative as they were when they started. They're, they're less innovative now, I think, but they, they, uh, you, you, we're in uh, 22 sites around the country, 17 states in the district, and we have about 50 mobile units on the ground providing uh, comprehensive primary care, mental health care, oral health care. And uh, we see what's happening out in communities, and, 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 and we're feeling it every day. And I'm hearing it, uh, hearing it from our medical providers, the, the pediatricians and nurse practitioners and nurses that provide services to, uh, to, our, to, to the populations we serve. And, uh, and it's occurred to us, and I'll just be brief, uh, uh, that with all the advances that, that we've made in programs, as, as Bruce mentioned, uh, like Medicaid and, and CHIP, getting folks enrolled with the um, ACA um, uh, providing a vehicle for, for folks to get insurance. Uh, we're very pleased to see that that, that, that one issue, uh, getting kids insured, is being addressed in a very proactive and aggressive way, and we're really making some gains. We're really pleased with that. Uh, but as many of you may know, uh, health insurance doesn't guarantee health access. Uh, I mean, we have a, a, a steep road to, to, to go, uh, a steep hill to climb, uh, to, to get uh, access to, to those, to those same, same kids, many of whom are insured, and of course, we still have the issues with those who are uninsured. Uh, and we see those kids in our programs all the time. And so when we talk about uh, in disinvesting in children, when we talk about uh, having less of the, of the pie, um, the, the, the trend line being against kids, that's something that, that impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. And what it means is that kids that, uh, that benefit from the programs that get, uh, that benefit from appropriations, programs like the maternal and child health block grants and, and the lead poisoning prevention and, and national asthma control program, all of which are seeing uh, reductions, uh, th this is, really has an impact on, on, on the kids that we see on our vans and the kids we see in uh, the other community-based sites that we provide services to. Um, these kids, uh, you know, it just fundamentally doesn't make sense to us that we would diminish uh, the, the resources that we need uh, for this population while we're simultaneously um, getting more kids insured. It, it doesn't make, it's not coherent. So if you're, if you're bringing millions of children into the healthcare system, um, and, and these kids, because they're representing populations that have traditionally been underserved, they've been without care, they have uh, more pent-up health care need, uh, they're, they're kids in poverty uh, they're, who, are, who, are, who are now insured, we, they need more services uh, than, than ever, and, and so the system is not providing the, the, the very glue that holds the, 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 the health care service, uh, the health safety net for these kids together. It, we're, we're, we're cutting uh, services at the same time we're increasing the number of, of kids who need services. So uh, that, that to me is, is it, it just on its face 
doesn't make sense. And, uh, and, and that's one of the, 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 the main drivers of our advocacy. You know, how can we, we, we need to turn this around and, and we need to work collaboratively uh, to make sure that uh, we're looking at the whole child, not just their health care needs. We, we need to, to look at how health uh, relates to their educational success. Uh, we need to look at uh, nutrition issues. The, these are, you know, we, what we advocate for at the fund is a, a whole child approach where we start to break up the silos of advocacy that, uh, that we so often fall into uh, when we look at our narrow tranche of, of interest. So uh, that's one of the things that the, the Budget Coalition has, has been uh, most effective at doing is getting us to see over the top of our silos, uh, looking at ways to break that, those silos down. And just one example of that is most recently we had our medical leadership up on the Hill. Jared was kind enough to come over and speak to our group. Uh, and we went up, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk to Congress about was the Strong Start Bill that, that Senator Harkin had put up to, uh, to you know, move us in the direction of universal pre-K. And uh, so we went to the Hill and, and, and we talked about uh, a key component that a lot of folks on a lot of the health LAs weren't aware of, and that is that there were strong screening provisions in there. Um, and, uh, and so we, we so Increasingly, in, in past years, now we're, we're going up and talking about things like early childhood education from a health perspective, uh, going up and talking about immigration reform from a health perspective. And I think we need to see more of that, and that's uh, the, the pathway forward on the advocacy side. Thanks, and Steve. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity today, and, and we also applaud um, this fabulous work. It's going to be really, really useful to all of us. Um, I want to elaborate a little bit on what the impact of these numbers are that we're talking about today on individual nonprofit agencies, direct service providers on the ground. And United Way is mainly not a direct service provider, but we have relationships through across the country with these direct service providers. Um, I actually have a question for the audience just to get a sense of where we are. I know, I know there's a lot of folks in the audience who are um, work with national advocacy organizations who are based here in D.C. Um, some of you have affiliates that are actually direct service providers. There may be some of you who are here who just represent direct service providers. Could, could I get a show of hands of people in the audience who actually have affiliates or somehow um, direct service providers? So, some, so, so those of you who raise your hand may have a little bit better sense of, of where I'm going, but um, I think this is good because I think it's important that people understand really what the impact is on direct service providers. So, so most direct service providers are piecing together their budgets and how they're providing their services from a whole variety of sources. They get some of their funding from government sources. They get some of their funding, many of them get some of their funding from United Way. Um, there's, there's tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands probably of direct service providers across the country. United Way provides funding for 37,000 agencies. Um, I will tell you that government sources is the largest portion of that budget. Um, United Way is the largest non-government funder of services. So I'm going to ask you guys a question with some numbers. I'm going to ask you two questions and then I'll give you both answers afterwards. Here are the answers, or the possible answers. It's multiple choice. 5%, 25%, 40%, and 60%. The question is, what percentage of the 37,000 agencies we fund what percentage of their budget comes from United Way, and what percentage of their budget comes from the federal government? So the first question, percentage of the budget from the federal government, raise your hand if you think it's 5%, raise your hand if you think it's 25%, raise your hand if you think it's 40%, this is all government sources actually, all government sources, 40%, raise your hand if you think it's 60%. Okay, for United Way funded agencies, how many of you think that United Way provides 5% of the budget, 25% of the budget, 40% of the budget, 60% of the budget? On average, the 37,000 agencies that receive funding from United Way, from the, those agencies receive 40% of their budget from government sources. They receive 5% of their budget from United Way. 
So when you look at these cuts, when you look at these numbers, the largest non-government funder is giving them 5%. The, the government is giving them 40%. And you look at the cuts to funding for these programs, you see that there is no way that United Way or any other source of funding is going to be able to make up for it. And that's one of the issues we run into Capitol Hill, and you hear people say sometimes offhandedly, well, the charities will step up, the private sector will step up, private funding will, will make up for it. There's just no way that they can. And so the impact for these direct service providers on the ground, when they are trying to piece together their budget and they're trying to provide um, to provide services, at the end of the day, they might come to United Way and ask us to make up some of the deficit, and we may or may not be able to make up a little bit. But at the end of the day, they're going to be cutting services. That's just the bottom line. They're going to be able to cut cut services. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of discussion about how how these actually impact on the ground service providers. Thanks, Steve. And, and Mark, how did this really impact the education? And I know particularly with sequester, you know, education primarily it's funded through the discretionary portion of the budget, which means in the annual appropriation. So the sequester, which fell sort of disproportionately on the, on the discretionary side of it, really hit education, if you want to talk about that. Sure. Such a cheery topic. Um, so I'll echo what uh, my colleague said. Thank you to First Focus for having this panel, for inviting us. Um, the publication you guys put out every year is Lately, it's been very sobering, but it's it's full of really important information, and I think you know we cannot collectively talk about this issue enough. And then we have to figure out how we get from talking about it to actually driving action um, with those who can have an impact. Um, so, I mean, to me, this goes back about four years, and I noticed Bruce's charts all started with 2010, which is when we started talking about um, the debt limit and the debt crisis and the Budget Control Act, and then that, that led to sequestration. Um, and ever since then, we've kind of been in this mode of cut after cut after cut and playing defense. And I think Congressman Doggett kind of referred to this. We've sort of, as a result, we've kind of lowered our expectations. So last December, when the budget agreement came together with both parties, we were among the groups that said, okay, you know what, we're, we're turning the corner. This is somewhat positive. We found a silver lining in the, in the fact that we were partially restoring most of the sequester cuts and that there was priority given to a lot of the core formula grant programs that impact education like Title I and IDA, um, trying to address inequities. So that's good, and it's true. We should have context, obviously, but the reality is we've kind of lowered our expectations, and I think we've got to figure out as a collective society how we get back to making sure that Congress is not just restoring the cuts that they made, which were a mistake in the first place, but really increasing investments in our kids going forward. Um, the concern is that we're coming back to we have this brief reprieve. It's okay. It's not great. And then next year, we're looking at the sequester again for another seven or eight years. And if we stay on that same path, we're going to be looking at funding for all discretionary programs outside of defense at the same level as they were in the Eisenhower administration, if you adjust for inflation. So we're going back to the 1950s, the 1950s. So that was before ESEA. That was before IDEA. That was before mandatory programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I mean, think for a minute, like, what CEO on this planet or what small business owner or what leader of any organization would say, all right, guys, we are going to go back to the 1950s. We're going we're gonna to try to operate like people did 50 or 60 years ago. No one would say that. But that's the path that we are on as a country because of the, the decisions that Congress has been making. So, you know, we cannot cut our way to prosperity. Um, we cannot be limiting the opportunities that kids are getting. We should be expanding those opportunities. Um, Bruce already gave the numbers. I'll, I'll talk about some of the impacts that we've seen um, on kids going forward. I mean, we, we've looked at what these cuts meant, sequester, even before sequester. Um, part of it also is it, the numbers are important. I mean, we've lost like 300,000 jobs since the recession. So we're actually at the same level we were at about a decade ago. But in that time, we've had almost a million more kids in our, our schools at all levels, K-12, higher education. So more students, more students with needs, fewer educators in our classroom. So the impact there is what? Bigger class sizes, um, less individual attention on kids who need it the most. We've seen that all over the country. Um, GAO did a report on the sequester impact. They looked at impact aid districts, which were hit first and foremost. Um, they talked about we're cutting back on maintenance issues, so then there were stories about, surprise, surprise, we'd have flooded classrooms. We're going to have to spend money now to repair those classrooms. 
um, they looked at elementary schools and the impact was more kids in the classes, you know, two or three more kids per class. So how many, how many people in this room are parents or grandparents? Okay, so uh, we have two kids at home. I can tell you how hard it is to keep up with two kids. So you add even three kids in a classroom of 25, 30 kids, that makes a difference. That means less individual attention for the kids. Um, and then we've, we've heard individual stories. You know, there was a mother in California who has a daughter with autism who said their bus drivers were furloughed because of the cuts, so they had longer school bus routes. They had to wait sometimes an hour for the bus to come pick um, the girl up in the morning, which is very hard for her to wait. It can throw off her entire day. Um, you know, we heard from superintendents in Kentucky, a really rural district, that they had been making cut after cut after cut. And, you know, politicians often say, well, you know, you've, there's lots of fat in the budget. You can find ways to cut it. Well, the reality is at every level they've been cutting for a number of years. So they cut all the fat away. Now the cuts that they've been having to make are, are directly impacting kids. They cut art classes. Then they cut music classes. Then they cut PE classes. Then they're cutting counseling services. Um, again, going in the wrong direction. We heard from a special education teacher in Pennsylvania who was remembering a time when she had eight kids in a class plus a paraeducator. So they, you know, the kind of attention that you would want for kids who need it. And after a round of budget cuts, including the, the federal level, she's looking at 17 kids in her class, no paraeducator. So, you know, as a parent and as an advocate, you know what that means each and every day for the kids in those classrooms. You know what it means and the strain that it puts on the educators that are trying to do uh, a good job. So, you know, the, what we hear all the time from politicians is, well, we're making these cuts because uh, we have this huge national debt, this huge federal debt. So we're actually, we're thinking about our grandkids when we make these cuts. Hogwash. I mean, <laughs> kids get one shot at a good start. They get one shot at a good start in education, and their future is right now. And if we keep cutting and cutting and cutting the way we have been as a country, and especially at the federal level, we are not doing them a service, and we're not going to help our country going forward. So um, thank you guys for First Focus, for, for bringing us together, and let's figure out how we can turn it around. Thanks. And uh, Alyssa? Yes, thank you as well to First Focus for putting out this report. It's going to help me write all my outreaches for the remainder of the year, so that's very helpful for me. <laughs> um, so as Jared had said, Moms Rising has over a million members, and we're in every single state in the union. Um, so we hear from moms all the time, all across the country, how these cuts are affecting them. Um, for us, the main way that we hear from people is they send in stories. And um, I can tell you that the last couple of years, those stories have increased. They've be become more desperate, more upsetting. But we're also hearing from people who I call them like the alumni of these programs. They're the moms whose kids have been through these programs and it's saved their life, saved their education, mm -hmm. created a brighter future for them. Um, I think it's important to connect real people with real policies. And so I just wanted to share just a couple of um, the stories that we heard just in um, this past fall during the um, government shutdown and um, kind of wrapping up of some of the sequester cuts. So Jody from Michigan told us, my family relies on assistance provided through the WIC program to provide grocery assistance. It is extremely difficult to stretch our budget to cover our monthly food costs as it is. Combine the cut in this essential program with the predicted food cost increases, and I'm honestly not sure how we will provide our children with the healthy foods they need. Angela from Alabama wrote us saying, my oldest daughter is a product of participating in Head Start. She is an advanced diploma honor high school graduate, honor college student, full-time employed, volunteers with various community projects, and an active church member. She participated in Head Start for two years. It had such a positive impact on her. And Ramona from Texas wrote, saying, I lost my job the day I was to return from maternity leave. As a single mom of two small children, I don't know what I would have done had it not been for SNAP, WIC, and daycare assistance. Thanks to these programs, I was able to use that layoff as a blessing and just recently graduated nursing school and obtained my nurse's license. Please don't take away programs that could be what saves millions of struggling families. So this is just an example of what we get every single day. So we share stories like this with elected officials, with the public, with other organizations, because we think it's really important to put a personal touch, a, an actual face of a mom with what's happening. Um, it's, 
it's harder to deny that these cuts are actually hurting people. It makes it much more difficult to say that this is just money and we need to save money when you have a mom with her kid sitting in your office, as we've done with many, with Sarah many times, and we did just this morning up on Capitol Hill. Um, we think that these help policymakers make their decisions, and if they make the wrong decision, um, at least they know the effects it's going to have on people. Um, the other thing that we realize with moms when we talk about these issues that um, that they know that if they're not just the only one having this problem, if we hear from hundreds and hundreds of moms on a specific problem. We know it's a structural problem that's happening across the nation. It's not just a problem that's happening in your family, in your household, that you have to deal with personally. When we hear about mothers who can't afford to put food on the table, mothers who are having um, to wait you know, on a 500-person waiting list to get into a Head Start program, we realize this is a structural problem. And when you have a structural problem, there is a policy fix to that. And that's when we go um, to our elected leaders to you know, kind of tell them about this. Um, so our moms across the nation have mobilized for greater investments um, in, cho in children. And we've dodged a number of bullets in regards to cuts to Head Start and WIC. Um, these are two discretionary programs that were saved from further cuts and partially refunded from the sequester. I say partially because not completely. Um, with WIC in particular, every single year, it just seems like we're just going to be able to carry our um, caseload. And that's what the funding looks like. God forbid something major happens. God forbid there is a drought somewhere or a major international crisis and food prices start to go up. WIC will then no longer be able to take any new moms into the program. And we're going to have a problem like we faced during, that we thought we were going to have during the sequester where um, WIC across the country were having to decide between cutting the program for pregnant mothers, newborn babies, or toddlers. And those are three groups you should never have to choose between um, denying um, you know, breast pumps to and food and breastfeeding um, education. So those refunds um, likely have not, wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for groups like Moms Rising and many of the people in this room, um, because I think we pushed very hard and we forced our elected officials into a position where they couldn't, they could no longer say no to children and to moms, and that's a very powerful thing. Now the problem is, is that that's not a guaranteed piece in the next year or so, and so we're going to have to just keep up that fight. We're going to have to co collect those stories, and what Moms Rising likes to do is combine the stories that we have with data like this that First Focus has, and create a case that elected officials just can't deny. Thanks, Alyssa, um, and. One of the other things, uh, as I mentioned to begin with, we you know we formed this coalition. Our first focus formed the coalition to you know again create a collaboration crossing the silos, as as Dennis said. Um, but I know all of your groups have been also very effective at forming coalitions and forming partnerships um, at various levels. So I'm wondering if if each of you could maybe give an example or two of of an instance where you guys have worked with other groups, um, you know either at the local, state, or national level to you know besides the budget coalition. To, to really raise up the, the kids' voices and successes from that. Um, I'll change it up. Mark, why don't we start with you? Okay, a um, couple examples. One, one was related to last year's budget agreement and then knowing that there was gonna be at least an opportunity for um, appropriators and leaders like Senator Murray and Senator Mikulski and others to, to try to put a little bit more money into some of the key programs that we consider um, so important for addressing equity issues like Title I and IDA, so we partnered with a lot of the other big education groups, the superintendents, the school board association, AFT, uh, Council of Great City Schools, and all of our affiliates, and specifically focused on appropriators who were going to be making the decision, um, you know, in January. So during the hol the winter holidays, we actually had a lot of members going and doing back home meetings with senators and representatives when they were home for the holidays. Um, you know, they're going to be there, talk about the issues, um, and it worked. I mean, we ended up getting priority was given to those programs. So um, I think that's one example, being really targeted and taking advantage of um, when members are back home, that's a good time to really talk with them and talk about the impacts that, that um, are happening back in their own districts and their states. The other thing is, um, goes back to the, the overall big budget fight. And so 
um, you know, take advantage of a crisis it presents an opportunity, I guess, um, or misery loves company, I guess, is another way of looking at it. So the non-defense discretionary coalition, the NDD coalition, which I guess on the Hill that means something to people. Um, we've had lots of discussions about, does that mean anything to real people? No, it actually doesn't. Um, but so it's, it's all the sectors. I mean, it's groups that, honestly, we probably hadn't worked with a whole heck of a lot, but we're all in the same boat, which is taking on a lot of water right now. Um, so education, healthcare, transportation, you know, any, any organization that represents interest um, outside of the defense industry, we're part of this coalition to talk about, here's what actually non-defense funding means. Here are, the, here are the programs that are helped by this. Here are the people that are helped by this and try to put a face on it. And the argument was, you know, we, we're all good at arguing for our own individual programs, um, but if the overall pie keeps getting smaller and smaller, which it has been, then we're fighting over the scraps. And so we got to collectively talk about why we need a bigger overall federal investment. Um, and then the sequester has been such an is issue even for the defense industry. I mean, I wouldn't say we've necessarily um, – completely partnered with the defense industry, but we're, we're all kind of now singing from the same song sheet that the the, pot, the overall pot needs to be bigger, not just for defense, but non-defense. And so um, I think going forward, you know, it's that's something that's really important for advocates to make sure we don't get decoupled from, you know, an, a, a sector that obviously has an awful lot of influence and power. Um, and so far, we've been able to hold together on that, thanks to um, our champions on the Hill. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, and then, Steve, we'll go to you. How have bringing the kids' communities in different areas helped? Well, so so thinking about the question, uh, um, uh, I, we associate, associate ourselves with a lot of great organizations that are doing good work on specific issues. And so um, we, we work very hard on the earned income tax credit, for instance, and the leader, really, one of the leaders in Washington is the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. So on that issue, we align ourselves very closely with them. Um, the National Skills Coalition does, you know, sort of a leader in the workforce um, investment at, uh, arena, and so we'll align ourselves there. And I think that one of the things that we have found is on particular issues, aligning yourselves with those organizations that are sort of the expert on those issues has been, it's been really useful to United Way as an organization that, that um, covers a broad array of issues. And so it really helps increase our capacity by identifying who the leaders are on the issues. And, and of course, on children's issues, we align ourselves with First Focus. So, um, but but I also would say that that in in a way, United Way itself is sort of a, a, a big kind of core coalition for us. We have 1,200 United Ways in the United States, and actually, you're right in your original in introduction. We're in 45 countries, um, but in the United States, we're in all 50 states, and it's 1,200 United Ways, which are all separate 501c3s, by the way. And so a lot of the work that United Way Worldwide does, and Lindsay Tirico from United Way Worldwide is here, here too, a lot of the work that we do is pulling together all those local United Ways into, you know, into sort of a single vo voice. So that's sort of our own kind of home coalition. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And uh, Alyssa, we'll go back to you. How is how is working in the budget coalition specifically also helped? Is it... I guess one of the you know one of the things that we heard was some of the groups just don't have the capacity to focus to Steve's point you know on sort of specific issues there they've got their own mission so how you know has working sort of in a in a coalition where you can focus on the budget but it's not sort of your you know you don't have to de devote necessarily a ton of manpower because there's other groups who are helping out has that has that made a difference I think so definitely and I think um, you know Moms Rising works on policy but we're not a policy shop we have over 200 organizations, um, including First Focus, NEA, many of the people on this panel in this room that we turn to for you know the things that we might not have as our powerhouse. And so the coalition has kind of um, allowed us to, I would say, outsource the pieces that we might be weaker on and then couple it with the pieces that we're really strong on, which is um, you know creating kind of um, a force, a, a momentum, as we like to call it, um, out in the field of, you know, we can get tons and tons of people to sign on to a petition, but we use the, 
the statistics and the talking points from various policy shops on various issues to kind of build that case and to craft the letter to, that we eventually delivered to Congress. Um, I think from our end too, like where, where we benefit a lot from using the partnerships in the coalition is we have a huge social media presence and we see this as um, an opportunity to really grow um, you know, current activism and future activists. And um, it's kind of the new frontier that I think some of the more traditional organizations in DC are just figuring out and Moms Rising has just kind of fallen into this world where it's been incredibly powerful. And so we've done things like tweet chats um, that we then share with the coalition and people jump in. And for those of you that don't know what a tweet chat is, it's, um, it's basically a conversation like this, but it happens on Twitter. And we have a series of questions and we'll have some policy experts and then just everyday people can kind of jump in and we'll do it on a variety of different issues. We'll, we did one um, in September when the stats came out about poverty and hunger and we weaved that right into the budget fight that we were having and we worked with many groups around DC to kind of provide the policy background and the explanation and then our moms kind of jumped in and talked about what was really happening in their hometowns. And then we also do something called blog carnivals, um, which we haven't done one for children in the budget, but I really want to do one because I think our, our coalition doing something like that would be really wonderful. And a blog carnival is just an opportunity for organizations, individual people, elected officials, celebrities, we get celebrities sometimes to participate, um, to talk about one issue. So, um, you know, we'll do one on, you know, we could do one on the budget, we've done one on breastfeeding, we've done one on healthcare, and everyone can talk about it from whatever their point of view is. And then Moms Rising kind of wraps it up into a package with a nice little bow, and we send out links, and we send it over social media, and people can go one-stop shopping to one link and read all of these different perspectives about what healthcare means for children. And so that's kind of an opportunity for us to use what our strengths are and then also highlight the strengths of all of our organizations. Um, and I think the other important piece, just to, to stay on the social media piece one more time, is we don't need to depend on the media to create a media moment. The power of social media is you can create that media moment at any time that you want. Um, we could either jump into a conversation as we see it happening, if there's a news item or if Congress starts fighting about something, um, or if we just say, you know what, no one is talking about this and we want them to start talking about it so we can just create it online ourselves. And that's really important because it falls back into the laps of the organizations and the activists and you don't have to depend on the usual news cycle and you know our social media reach is huge so if when we start talking about something a lot of other people start talking about it and we've seen it picked up in the traditional press after we started talking about it and we have all this lingo about impressions and and Twitter followers and all this stuff. But really what it is is that you start a chatter and then it gets picked up. And so I think that's an important tool because Bruce was saying that up on the Senate when he talked to people that you know they talk about children's issues about once a month if that. Well, we can be talking about it a lot more than that on social media and that will eventually get picked up um, up on the Hill and in the traditional press. And Dennis, last but not least. Oh, sure. So um, we're, we're not in Washington, so we don't have the benefit of uh, being in close proximity to, to a lot of folks who are working on issues that are similar to ours. But we are in New York, and New York provides its own uh, platform. Um, and when we decided, for instance, that we wanted to, uh, uh, to move aggressively into um, supporting our Healthy and Ready to, to Learn initiative, where we are trying to, uh, uh, to have kids screen for um, – for certain sentinel conditions that would indicate that they, uh, if they're, they're not addressed, they would not perform optimally in school. Uh, we we uh, reached out to a, a, a very proactive mayor um, and a bunch of, of groups around the city, education groups who are uh, on this trajectory and aligned with them to uh, attach ourselves to, to the big push around early uh, childhood, universal early childhood education uh, through the de Blasio administration. And, and that provided a platform for us to talk about it. And we knew that would resonate in the, in the press in New York and then by extension uh, press elsewhere as, as they start to look at places where things like, like early childhood are being implemented successfully. And, and Dennis, I, I'm just going to jump in. I know because you mentioned uh, and well, 
wasn't that long ago the the policy conference that you guys, that you guys had and did a whole panel on some of the folks that are in the room uh, you know spoke did did the focus on the budget help your your state medical directors as well it, it definitely did because they they uh, depend on us and we're, we're a relatively small organization um, uh, but uh, with with great reach in terms of uh, uh, having programs all over, uh, across the country uh, we were able to bring uh, folks in uh, from Senator Murray's staff and and Jared and and, and other folks who were able to provide them with uh, with um, very up and, and a very close and 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 well informed perspectives on what was happening in Washington, which they needed to go up to the, to the hill. What we found is that providers uh, for uh, on, you know, on the health side, uh, when when congressional offices hear from doctors, when they hear from nurses and folks who are actually providing services, it does have an impact on them. So we we try and use that opportunity to amplify. Uh, what they're seeing uh, out in the in, in the field, whether it be the you know, the fact that cuts are causing uh, there to be fewer pediatric medical residents uh, because of GME cuts, or uh, the fact that there are fewer subspecialists to go around in isolated rural communities, um, you know, diminished resources for for asthma screening, for lead screening. These are all things that are very powerful when when uh, being presented directly to congressional staff or to members by by medical professionals. So we've been able to leverage our relatively small numbers by having quality information, by making sure folks are briefed appropriately, by having folks like uh, Jared and folks from the Center for Budget to come and, and address them directly to, to, to hear their questions to help them to develop strategies that work on the Hill. So yeah, it all, it all ties together uh, pretty nicely. Uh, also on the, on the preparedness side, we've worked with uh, uh, Save the Children and the Academy of Pediatrics because there's this whole spectrum of issues around pediatric disaster preparedness that go unrecognized by and large, and, 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 and we've been up on the Hill talking about those issues of, as well, and it, and it helps when you, when you can align with other advocacy groups and folks who understand how the budget works and what the issues are. It, it makes for a more powerful message being delivered on, in Washington. Thank you, Dennis. And I uh, just want to, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to open it up to any questions from the audience. Anyone? Seeing none, I, I will take the liberty and ask a question. I know. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I wanted to ask if anyone is working with. Um, I'm, I'm uh, um, I was wondering if anyone works with um, and gets support from employers, big um, businesses. Sure, absolutely. Um, United Way does, and so you know. Uh, we raise in the United States about four billion dollars every year. About 2.75 billion of that comes through workplace giving campaigns, where individuals in a workplace, you know, we, they they pledge to deduct a little bit uh, out of their paycheck to go. Um, but we probably get about we probably get about 750 million dollars a year. So about three quarters of a billion dollar come, dollars comes directly from um, corporations that support the work that we do in communities. So, so we do have a substantial amount of support that comes from uh, that comes from businesses. But, but I was talking more about the support in terms of the overall um, importance of having um, a focus on not you know I mean obviously it's important to get financial support, but you know working with employers to to get them to understand the importance of having a focus on children and, and you know, a, a focus on um, uh, on them supporting a children's budget. Um, from the advocacy perspective, right. from them actually weighing in. So, so that's, that's a really interesting question that we, that United Way struggles with a lot because we do have, a, the, the reason that we get that kind of financial support is because those businesses do believe in our mission, which is centered, which is largely centered around children's issues and helping helping in communities. Um, the environment, you know, frankly, the environment in the advocacy front um, for the last number of years, really since at least 2008 or 2009, is when we when we talk to those businesses and when we talk to the the lobbyists for those businesses. Um, they have felt very much like they have their their core issues that you know true whether you believe it or not to issues that are in 
core to their survival. And so they honestly don't really want to spend much of their political capital on issues that they don't feel are kind of their core to survi survival issues. When the economy is better, there's, you see more willingness of businesses to say, it is in my interest to have an educated workforce, so I'm going to go up to the Hill and say, you know what, we should invest in education. And so I hope we're going to be getting back to that point where we will have businesses advocating on this more. And I, I, oh, I was just going to, just very quickly, I mean, I know Starbucks had a large initiative um, to provide uh, to provide undergraduate education to their, their partners or their employees. Um, and hopefully that's a change, I think, that will We'll see, and certainly the more pushing, I think, the, the better. If what you're talking about is, is um, private sector involvement and support, uh, we, we have the Children's Health Fund has a, a corporate council for America's children. And for the past 20 years, they've been extremely involved in, in um, issues around child health access, uh, more recently around education and, and, and pediatric disaster preparedness. But they, they come with, with resources, and as we, try and exp uh, as we try to explain to them, uh, even if they give us a, a million dollar grant, as some do, that that's really just a drop in the bucket. What we really need is to uh, leverage through our advocacy work the, the larger expenditures and investments that happen at the federal level, at the state level. And they've, uh, they've been willing to help with that, they, you know, not only on the, the, even as far as um, letting us tap into their networks of, uh, of uh, support. And, and uh, you know, the, as you know, they're involved in a great deal of lobbying on behalf of their, of their own interests. But um, you know, they, they oftentimes uh, give us access to those same channels, and, and we use that to leverage on, uh, in, uh, on behalf of what we're trying to do advocacy-wise. Right. Time for one more. No. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, my name is Gary Newton. I'm with Save the Children here in Washington, D.C. I'm working on a new initiative to increase public investment in programs that work for children. This is an international effort. It's focused on supporting children's champions overseas, the Mozambican Bruce Leslie's, if you will, the Cambodian First Focuses. Um, <laughs> My question relates to, I mean, there's something wrong with the picture that was pre presented today, broadly speaking, particularly when I think of the slides that Bruce presented that illustrated uh, broad and deep uh, support for the idea of helping children, support that even includes uh, people who um, characterize themselves as Tea Party uh, members. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, we're talking about a, a systematic disinvestment in children. Uh, to what extent is this a, a failure of our, our advocacy approaches? Uh, this coalition, a terrific development. Uh, someone mentioned um, it's enabling you to look over the individual silos. Um, a comment on whether or not it's more effective to advocate for uh, children by silo, by type of problem, by specific program, or advocate for the whole child generally? What has more salience? I mean, something is not happening. <laughs> Alyssa? I think there's a, there's a couple of things going on. I think probably one of the biggest challenges that anyone that does the type of work I do, which is work on national budget issues and then have to go to the field and real people and real families and discuss national budget issues with them is that it's a complicated issue. And it's it's hard, you have to try very different ways to get them to understand why they should care about something called the sequester and how that's affecting their families. And they might totally get that they are on WIC or Medicaid or they are in a public school or they care about the environment but they still are not 100% sure about all this stuff that they see on TV and this very complicated language that we use. And it doesn't help that our elected officials continue to use that complicated language um, even when they're out in the states talking to people. I think the other issue that I've encountered was, you know, quote unquote, field fatigue. So what happened was we were really intense. We were collecting hundreds of stories a day during the government shutdown about all the trials and tribulations of how federal programs 
affected families and not just the government shutdown, but just that, you know, I was on food stamps for um, two months and it really helped me during a tough time. So we started to think, okay, they're getting it. The education programs have worked. And then the government shut down for about a month and we tried to go back to them in November to talk to them saying, hey, there's this thing called like a super committee and you, you wanna reach out to them. People didn't care anymore. They were so sick of government. They were so sick of, of the elected officials. They were so sick of the politicking. They still cared about WIC and Head Start and Medicaid, but they just didn't wanna advocate anymore because they didn't think the system was working. And we had a lot of people say that, you know, I just know I'm going to lose my house because I'm never going to get that unemployment insurance or, you know, I I know that my kid's not going to be able to get into that Head Start program and so why should I even bother anymore? So I think there is an issue, like a legitimate issue, and I don't have a hundred answers to this, otherwise I would be like the best advocate in D.C., but I think that there is a problem that is our news cycle doesn't really help, our elected officials and the fighting and the deep partisanship doesn't help and then it's just it's just complicated it's hard to understand you know I've been doing this for 10 years and I still need to go to Jared sometimes and be like can you explain what happened during this appropriations process so I think that part of it is just this is a tough issue and we need to figure out continue to figure out you new and unique ways to drill it down so people understand they're busy they're working multiple jobs their kid is sick why should they even care about these issues anymore? And we need to just find new ways to bring it home to their household, to their kitchen table, and to their community. And Steve, I know you'd wanted to say something. And in the interest of time, I will ask, sorry to just limit it to two minutes. I know, Mark, you wanted to say something quick, so, too. So I, I want to answer directly your question um, about the people, the people in this room. I don't think that in any way the people in this room have failed. I think that the, the people in this room are very effective at what they do. There's limits to what we can do because we are national organizations going on at, you know, as advocates. I think the key here is really what Alyssa was talking about is the grassroots. And members of Congress to really be influenced have to hear from their constituents. And Alyssa's talking about a pure grassroots individuals. Um, you know, maybe a, a, some some failure of engagement there. I think that also applies to the nonprofit agencies that are providing the services. So I was talking about the 37,000 agencies. They see the, the ones we interact with, their job is to provide direct services. Their job, they don't think, is to engage with their member of Congress in, in saying what's going on. And I will tell you that getting those little agencies that are out there stretched thin, trying to do everything they can, getting convincing them that it is that they need to spend a little bit of time engaging with their members of Congress, that is really the key, I think. Thanks, Steve. And Mark? Um, I mean, it's a great question. I think it's actually, you've hit on the biggest challenge we face, really. I mean, I, I'm not sure I completely agree with the polling. I mean, we always see polls and people say, oh, yeah, I'd raise taxes in, to help my schools. And, you know, a lot of it is the intensity. Are those the people that actually are going to turn out, you know, to take action and vote? Are they the ones that are actually going to keep track of how their member of Congress or their state lawmaker voted and either keep them in office or boot them out if they're not doing what they want? But I think it's it's kind of an inside-outside game. I mean, it's, it is complicated, like Alyssa said. Um, I think one thing we've been trying to do more of with NEA is lift up the voices of our, our, of our members because we joke all the time. We go up to the Hill. We have great lobbyists, but we're not real people. Um, we have numbers. We have arguments. We're very good. Um, but members want to hear from their constituents. They want to they look in the eyes of the student. We had a student a couple weeks ago crushing student debt, wants to be an educator. She had the room. Uh, Chairman Murray had a, another hearing that invited real people to testify, and she had that room, and she had even one of the most conservative members of the Republican caucus eating out of her hand by the end because she was she told her story, her dream of being a teacher, and this is why I took on so much debt. So will he vote with us down the road? I don't know, but his door is going to be open down the road. So I think it's at, at the federal level in D.C., you go in with the arguments. You can talk in big terms like NDD and sequester and all that because the staff and the members understand that. But 
at the grassroots local level, you got to really find what's that one connection that an individual constituent can make, tell the story, here's what, here's how this particular program that's lost in a maze of, you know, trillions of dollars at the federal budget, here's the impact it had on, on me or on my child, and get that member of Congress and their staff, and they're going to remember that. And so then when they're voting, you know, they may not, they may not support every program in the budget, but if they remember that one program that's funded out of this budget, then maybe you've got an opportunity. Yeah, I will. <clears throat> I think that's a, a great opportunity to close on. That was actually one of the topics that I, I was going to try to get us to, to touch on very briefly. Um, and I, I think everybody's encapsulated it well. One of the other ideas behind the Budget Coalition was to try to figure out, again, how we could disseminate the budget information to other advocacy groups who have large grassroots networks but may not focus on the policy side of things quite as in-depth, and how we can figure out the best way to get the sort of nitty-gritty policy details down to the grassroots level, to the organizations that are, you know, that are working with people who are, who are the best advocates um, because it's their livelihoods, um, and how then we can sort of lift that back up. And I, that would be, I think, I hope the message that you guys take away with this is, you know, how do we work together to make sure that, that people really understand how important the budget is to every sector that deals with kids. Um, so with that, thank you, and I will uh, turn it back over to Bruce.